Uh, I am honoured and delighted that I was asked to introduce Bill to give uh, the Hyatt lecture this semester. Uh, I've known Bill and Elizabeth and, uh, for a number of years now, and every time I get together with them, it's, 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 it's always a fun time. Uh, conversation is always uh, stimulating and exciting. Uh, when I was asked to introduce Bill uh, this morning, you know, you sort of think about the usual thing. Well, I'll, I'll pick up his resume or a shortened version of his resume and I'll read a few important things. Equally well, I realize that many of you are already familiar with that because uh, his bio has been on the wall in the lobby and there's been announcements about this uh, seminar, uh, this lecture. And so I decided that I, being, being, a, being a true engineer, I would veer into territory that I know very little about and probably got some of my worst grades in, and that is history. And I decided that it would be good for me to give you a little bit of history leading up to today's Hyatt lecture uh, by Bill Higginbottom. And so, uh, with apologies to, to, to everyone else, here's a little history. So, I started with general history, and I, I picked a number of years rather than trying to cover all of history. So for example, general history in 1983, uh, Reagan introduced his Star Wars proposal, uh, Sally Ride was the first woman in space, and you could buy a gallon of gas for a buck twenty-five. Um, I moved on a decade and uh, realized that that was the year that Beanie Babies were launched. Um, Pablo Escobar died, uh, and probably even more importantly, Ariana Grande <laughs> was born. Bill is now thinking, what the hell is happening here? I came to give a lecture on leadership, and they're introducing me at the same time as Ariana Grande. Uh, I took a big jump here. Um, 2016, so just four years ago, NASA reached Jupiter, uh, David Bowie passed away, and El Chapo was recaptured. As you can see, my sources of history were varied and quite uh, random. And finally, uh, 2020, <laughs> I just figured that at this point in time, coronavirus has got us off to a great start, and I'm not going to predict what's going to happen in the next 11 months. That's very broad, general history. I said, we need a little bit something more specific. So I said, well, let's look a little bit at business. And so back in 1983, ARPANET was adopted, or adopted TCP IP as the first step in founding the internet. Many of you here in this room don't even know what the world without an internet is like or how it could possibly function. Uh, in 98, uh, Google founded by uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, I'm pretty certain you all know what Google is and, and use it for just about everything. If I jump to 2016, the Brits voted to get out of Brexit, or to, to, to Brexit. Um, it's taken them a few years to complete the deal, but, but nonetheless. And uh, hard to believe it, but it's already four years since Volkswagen had a minor problem with their software and emissions control. And lastly, CreateX startup company Filio, which was founded by a few GTCE graduates, is going to go 10 times, it's going to grow 10 times this year. That's a prediction, but uh, I have every belief that it's a good, a good chance because when that, that uh, startup or that idea was in CreateX, one of its advisors was Bill Higginbottom. And so I'm, I think I'm going way out on a limb there predicting business history for 2020 by including there. But the real reason we're here, oh, sorry, I, I should say, I left a gap there, and one of the reasons is, is that in that gap, that covers the years that most current civil engineering students, be it even graduate students, were born. So uh, it's important to realize that everything to the left happened before you were born. So, not surprising you may not be that familiar with it. And although short history, things to the right are the things that are obviously you're more familiar with. So now, let's come down to the real meat of the history story, and that's the Higginbottom history. 
And one of the reasons I, I wanted to set this framework up before introducing Bill is that, as you might notice, Bill's history is going to go from before you were born until today. And more importantly, though, the things that he was doing throughout that period, uh, the, the innovative things he was doing, the creative things he was doing, uh, the entrepreneurial things he was doing, have transcended that entire history and that entire pe period of time. And I think it's important to recognize that, that, that here is somebody today giving us a Hyatt Leadership Lecture who was back there at the time and before Sergey Brin and Larry Page founded Google, uh, and he's still here today uh, uh, doing similar things, uh, being very creative, being very innovative. And the reason I feel comfortable in saying that is, is back in 1983, Bill founded his first company, uh, Chattahoochee Geotechnical Consultants. A decade later, he founded the company that he's currently uh, still primarily involved with, which is uh, ET Environmental Corporation, and he is uh, CEO and chairman of the board of that company. Um, he also, by the way, in the intervening years, was involved with, I believe, the, the creation of 11 other companies. And so, not surprising that in 2016, he was elected to the Georgia Tech College of Engineering Academy of um, Distinguished Engineering Alumni. And the latest part in the Bill Higginbottom history is that today he's here with us and he's going to deliver the Hyatt Lecture. And with that rather historical introduction, I am delighted to hand over to Bill and welcome him to give the lecture. Thank you, David. <clears throat> I asked David not to overblow the introduction, but he did. Um, <clears throat> if I'm apologizing in advance if I'm a little nervous. I'm not usually speaking in front of big audiences. Uh, this lecture series has been given nine times before by some giants in our profession. So I've got big shoes to fill. Um, I was fortunate enough to be here for the very first lecture by Dr. Clough. <clears throat> he packed the house. It was one of the best presentations I've ever heard on any topic, but it had to do with <clears throat> human impacts on climate. Um, had two classmates to give this lecture before. Wick Mormon uh, talked about his history with trying to modernize a 200-year-old company and a 200-year-old railroad industry and all the challenges he faced. Uh, my friend Andy Phelps came on and talked about building billions of dollars worth of projects at 14,000 feet in the Amazon mountain, I mean, excuse me, the Andes mountains. <clears throat> and lastly, another professional colleague, Emmy Montagna, came up and talked a very personal conversation about a woman's perspective on rising to the highest ranks in the engineering profession. So, that's not what this talk is about. This talk is going to be about a very personal recollection of how I've been able to marry up engineering and business throughout my career. <clears throat> so since it's personal, I got to start with who I am. So, I'm, I'm, I start off being rare because I'm an Atlanta native. Most of us are all transplants these days. <clears throat> I was very fortunate to grow up with two working parents. They gave me a tremendous work ethic. And my father, who was in sales all of his life, uh, taught me the value of optimism and perseverance. Because without that, you can't be in business and you can't be in sales. So <clears throat> um, I did manage to get out in 1976. Um, tried to get a master's, not unpredictably, business got in the way, so I took a series of courses, never got any traction. <clears throat> and between that, which was somewhere about uh, 1980, and becoming an advisory board member in 2014, I did what a lot of alumni do, run as hard and fast away from this place as you can. <clears throat> That's changed, so I am thrilled to be back involved with the school. Um, <clears throat> I just rolled off as the EAB chair. That's been a very professionally rewarding thing. <clears throat> the Createx mentor, I'll get into that more in a minute, has been a lot of fun. 
<clears throat> and throughout my career, and this is gonna tell you some of the things, some of the entrepreneurial and entrepreneurial ventures and adventures that I've done, I'll talk about that. So um, let me start with a little bit of background. Engineering and entrepreneurship, they're not the same thing. Um, <clears throat> I believe that my engineering career has been bettered by my business career, and I believe my business career has been way bettered by my engineering training. But again, these are, these are different things, and trying to live where these two things intersect is not always easy. But I was, again, because of the influence of my parents, I was a hardworking kid. Some of this stuff started in 1967. So I am at the tender young age of 14. So <clears throat> I'm hustling whatever I can to make money. And this isn't what I've done in terms of being an employee someplace. I've had some horrible, back-breaking, scut-level jobs. That's not this. This was all trying to create something that I could uh, be a success at and make some money. Some of them still go on today, particularly number three. So, <clears throat> with that bit of background, I'm a junior at Georgia Tech, and we didn't call them third and fourth years then, and I was a rising junior for a long time. <laughs> <clears throat> at least you get that joke. Um, and my best friend at the time is not college material, but he is a master plumber. And this is hard on the heels of the Arab oil embargo. So, over beers one night, we decided that we should go in the solar thermal engineering business. Sounded like a great idea at the time. I was broke. <clears throat> he had a little bit of money. We figured out a business plan on the back of a napkin. <clears throat> we started a business. First thing that somebody told me was, in order to do that, you have to now go get a certificate in what's called an HVAC mechanic, because heating, ventilation, air conditioning was the section of the code that determined whether or not you could do hot water system plumbing. So, <clears throat> long before the internet, I went down to the Board of Professional Regulation. They gave me a brochure. They gave me a name of a book. I bought the book. I took the test. We were in business. I did the design. We did the plumbing and the installation of solar hot water systems nights and weekends. We were a duly registered corporation. It paid for my last year of college. <clears throat> when I finally got a real job later, it was like too much of a distraction, so we wound that business down. <clears throat> I went to work for two local engineering firms, two stints, one three years, one four years. So seven years post-graduation, I decided that I think I can do this better than what the firms that I were working for were doing. During that seven year period, I was an entrepreneur. At both firms, I was bringing up <clears throat> new services, new ways of delivery, new ways of trying to serve clients and expand markets. Some were very effective, some fell on deaf ears. But when I decided to do it myself, <clears throat> I, was, um, I was out there without a net so to speak. So we started this business. It grew very fast. 1988, I made the Inc. 500 uh, 188th fastest growing company in the country. <clears throat> well, I was a sure enough bona fide entrepreneur by then, and then that led to starting these other companies. The construction company was focused on geotechnical and environmental remediation. So it is definitely linked to the process and the practice of engineering. The Brownfields real estate development opportunity was trying to source impacted properties that could, where remediation, repositioning could lead to a successful development. Underground Products Company, clever name at the time, was about selling all of the products that go into the construction practices for geotechnical engineering. So we sold drilling tools, sampling tools, we sold um, HDPE membranes, erosion control fabrics, stabilization fabrics, a number of things, again, all in the same ecosphere. Later, 
we took our soil testing drilling operations, we consolidated them, rebranded, retrained all of our folks, <clears throat> and we went into the environmental drilling business, doing hazardous waste services, hauling, drilling, <clears throat> and um, we're able to tap into a much larger environmental services market. In 1993, a large national engineering firm bought my firm, and we merged the two firms together. When that happened, um, interestingly enough and not surprisingly, they asked me to sell off the other business interests I had because they wanted me focused on their regional management structure. I, I did that. And then three months later, they asked me if I would take on uh, a joint venture between MCON Associates, the parent company, and Turner Construction, which at the time and is usually one of the top 10 builders in the country. The idea was we want to be in the design build business and work on environmental risk management practices for Turner's customers. So I was happy to take that on. At the time, there was nothing but a piece of paper between the two firms that suggested that there might be a means to cooperate. So we got involved, <clears throat> you know, wrote the, cor the corporation documents, got incorporated, and I spent almost two years um, entrepreneurially going between 40 offices on the engineering side and 40 offices on the construction side, convincing these two very old mature organizations that it's okay to cooperate and it's okay to bring your customers forward and it's okay to allow us to provide design build services. So I was able to convince them to take the necessary risks. So <clears throat> we ran that business for uh, up until 1999, and in 1999, both publicly traded companies were sold off. That means I was an orphan. That was not a very comfortable feeling, but I was unwilling to let go what I had spent that many years trying to build, so I convinced both boards of directors to let me put a leveraged buyout offer in front of the companies and buy the company back. That was particularly difficult because I was largely involved in building. It was a $50 million company at the time. So I was actually being asked to, to buy what I had built. That was not an easy proposition. But we made it work. So we formed the acquisition corporation as a vehicle to buy the business back from the two majority parent companies. Later, as we became, so, so at this point we control the business, so I don't have to report to publicly traded committees anymore. We got a little bit more entrepreneurial. We started a business that was, would allow us to do self-performing environmental services work. This is not one of our success stories because we could never get that off the ground. Later, because of the absolutely insane licensing laws in the state of California, we had to start another corporation just to house our construction management license. <clears throat> Later again, this is a personal venture, um, the Marthasville Land Company venture didn't really work out. There's a, there's a lesson behind that I'll get to in a minute. But I tried another real estate development. It worked out very well. And there's another story with that. Um, we expanded into Canada in 2010. Extremely difficult place to do business. Don't get confused about the fact that they're very nice people and speak English. Th their bureaucracy up there is absolutely impenetrable. And then lastly, last year, um, it's notice it's the first one with my name on it, is I've started a, a little baby venture capital company and as David had mentioned, um, Filio was one of my mentees in the CreateX program and have actually invested in them. So, so every time I've done something, I've tried to learn something from it. And this talk <laughs> has enabled me to go back and clarify some of those thoughts. So the first thing is that business that I started in college was fall over easy. I didn't know what I didn't know. We just simply managed to navigate, you know, we were 19. 
We, we manage to navigate how to get a corporation started, how to go out and without a written business plan, we manage to go out and find customers, execute work, make money, and when it became a little inconvenient because my first job out of school had a lot of traveling involved in it, and we decided to wind it down, the wind down was easy. So it, it, that has influenced all of these other business formations in as much as business is not as hard as you think. Atlanta is an incredibly easy place to do business compared to other portions of the United States and certainly in terms of international exposure. So <clears throat> it, it was successful enough that I think that registered as I went into my early stages of my professional career. I got licensed, I matured, learned how to manage people. The, the whole notion of if I want to do something it's not that hard stuck with me. With the engineering firm, um, making the Inc. 500 was a big personal challenge for me and it was a great honor. Met with my banker later and he said, we're not going to be able to bank you anymore. They don't want, service, services businesses struggle at high growth rates. They outstrip their capital. So he told me something that I was unaware of and lo and behold, he was right. We ended up with a lot of the challenges that service, fast growing service businesses come up against and that's managing cash flow in periods of time when you are trying to also raise the standard of your services, go through geographic expansions, <clears throat> and try to grow your headcount. So that became pretty painful over time. Next lesson is the little construction company we had. It made stellar margins because they were very specialty projects <clears throat> and we were essentially all negotiated work. After I sold my interest off, the partners that I sold it to got what we call in the construction business a case of yellow fever. They wanted to buy bigger and more expensive pieces of yellow iron. They wanted tractors and front end loaders and backhoes. And they ended up with such fixed overhead that eventually the business failed under the weight. Had it stayed focused, then they would still be in business and they would still have those stellar margins because it's such a specialty piece of work. It was high risk, high service, high value work. They took it in the opposite direction. So <clears throat> that was a shame. It didn't directly impact me, but it stuck with me. So uh, trying to get away from what your founding purpose is, you have to be very careful about that. And I would always suggest caution because your first idea oftentimes is your best idea. So with the, my first entree into real estate development, I thought we were doing a, a wise thing, found a site, understood the environmental remediation, we understood the purchase price, went to the bank, the bank says, you gotta be kidding me. So I, I was too optimistic and not seasoned enough to understand that we needed a much bigger balance sheet to be able to do real estate leverage with the investment in order to get to the pro forma, which was the <clears throat> selling of a remediated piece of real estate. So I was pretty disappointed, but we wound that business down because my balance sheet wasn't going to improve in the short term enough to allow that. But sometimes you can sort of get it right, but it, it, if you don't have the right capital, it's not gonna work. So on the underground products set, Again, it's a case of doing everything right. That business lasted about three years. We worked through all our distribution arrangements with all the manufacturers, went through sales contracts, warehousing space. <clears throat> we needed to be in probably eight cities. We were in one. The margin on products is not like the margin on engineering services or in construction. So we were working on thin margins and it, it that business never got past a, a glorified break even. So I sold that interest back and then it eventually closed in an orderly way. So environmental exploration. <clears throat> in that period of time, in the late 80s, the, it, there was an environmental services gold rush going on. 
everybody, if you came out of school with anything that said ecology or environment on it, it didn't mean that you were a graduate of Georgia Tech, it just could have been a graduate of a junior college, you could get a job as an environmental specialist. It was a very frustrating period of time. We did some of the consulting work, but we could never get the sort of staff and the traction that we wanted. So we repositioned our drilling business and we positioned EEI to be the dominant drilling provider in the Southeast for all of the big firms who had successfully merged and penetrated into the environmental business. That business is still operating today, doing exactly the same thing. <clears throat> and then ET. So when, when we merged with MCON, I had absolutely no clue that there was gonna be another opportunity out there. And it was truly the right time and the right place. So there is not a business opportunity out there in my horizon or all of your horizons that won't be greatly benefited by a little bit of timing luck. <clears throat> so to continue, the acquisition piece. This was, a, this was a real challenge. Buying what you had built was a challenge. Arranging the startup capital to make the purchase. And then after we had all that done, all the, it was, the deal was totally papered up. My old parent company had been acquired and the acquired company filed Chapter 11 bankruptcy. So <clears throat> what that meant was I had to renegotiate the deal, number one. Number two, we were, we were an item in a 200 item list in the bankruptcy court. So we were unable to take possession of the company for almost six months. So it was purgatory at best. So it turned out to be a very difficult thing, but it was the best thing. It was the best thing for my employees. Today, we are, uh, we've just, in 2016, we've converted to an uh, employee stock ownership program. So we have 53 shareholders. The company's very successful. But had you asked me in the winter of 2001, while we are in the purgatory of bankruptcy court, and a deal that I didn't know if it was gonna uh, consummate or not, it wasn't the best time to ask that question. Labor works, we tried, some ideas just don't get there. Uh, Parkview Partners, it was a residential real estate development. Um, I started the project in 2006. It was an expensive single family home. I sold it in the spring of 2007. David did not put up there in part of his history lesson what happened in the spring of 2007 which was the market cracked wide open. And were it not for that, that wouldn't be a good story to tell, but it worked out just right. And then <clears throat> as it comes to ET Canada, there is, there's not, not dissing on the Canadians, but there's not a federal government in Canada with any power. So every province in Canada has its own incorporation laws, its own it's generally based on English common law, but their own contractor licenses. So to do business in Canada, you have to do business in every single province. So the administrative cost to go up there it has no relevance to what it costs to start a business here. It's a very expensive thing to do. So 2019, I'll start HSI. We'll see. Startups are pretty exciting. It's, it's fun to be part of it. It's fun to do the mentoring but there's, there's money at risk and we'll see how we can, uh, together, it, it, I'm invested in Filio and another company called Ethos Medical, which is another one of the CreateX teams. We'll see how that works. <clears throat> so, how does that apply to tech today? When Reggie first asked me to join the board, one of the first questions I asked him and subsequently asked Don was, what's the school doing to create a business focus, uh, to, to have some entrepreneurship? And the answer, sadly, was since 1976, when I was here, the two pre the prerequisite business classes had been eliminated from the curriculum. So in 14, I'm getting exposed to the CEE advisory board. I'm suddenly dealing with the, the provost and the College of Engineering, I'm hearing all the great things that are going on campus. So 
I started to, at that point, started to agitate a little bit about what can we do to make civil as, as entrepreneurial as the other schools. Along the way, <clears throat> um, Rudy Bonaparte, who runs the GELM class, he and our old friends and neighbors and colleagues, he asked me if I would be a team mentor. I've done that three of the last four years. That's been an absolute blast. Um, there are so many of these students who have great technical ideas, but they can really use the rounding on the business side, so we have a lot of fun trying to shape their ideas, shape their presentations, etc. Uh, joining the CreateX mentor team has been terrific. And ultimately, you agitate too much, you get punished. So I got asked to join, uh, Dr. Kennedy asked me to join the task force to see what can be done. We went through a couple of meetings and some idea development. And then Don asked me to um, see if I would be prepared to teach what is the uh, innovation and entrepreneurship class called CEE 4803. Some of the kids from the class are here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, that too is a blast. We're doing the same thing that we do in GELM in terms of shaping the business ideas shaping the presentation skills, taking a lot of technical knowledge and try to season it with a little bit of business knowledge. So, <clears throat> it's fair to say, I'm, I've just started my 44th year in business or career, depending on which word you want to use. <clears throat> I still self-identify as an engineer. It, on no application, no, in, nothing I've ever filled out, I've ever said CEO, businessman, salesman, anything. It's always engineer. <clears throat> and that's the power of this education. Nothing has made me prouder in my career than graduating here with this degree. <clears throat> but there's, a, I've got a whole parallel piece to my career which has been on the business side. And as I said earlier, um, I think that we produce such remarkable technical graduates here. I believe that there is a tremendous rounding function that can occur by sprinkling in some business sense and business skills. So I really think that, that the idea of having um, living at that intersection where you're doing both is important. Some of the most impressive people I've ever met in this business have had, have gained their tenure and they've gained their prominence by being involved in the business side and not purely on the technical side. If you're going to take the risk to go into business, and it is a risk, you're going to learn something from it. As I tried to point out, I've learned a little something different from all these different opportunities. <clears throat> and I believe that I probably came out of the womb with an entrepreneurial bent, but I came here and this school made me into a good engineer. But the entrepreneur piece, it's intrinsic, it's organic, and if you can, <clears throat> if you can match the two up, to me it's been a very rewarding career, more so because of doing both rather than doing one. So <clears throat> you can live on both sides of that equation and you can have a, a really exciting career. And as the tagline of the school says, if you can live where those two things come together, if you can, as I said, <clears throat> improve your business acumen with the rigorous engineering training you're given here, if you can take a, a sense of business and a sense of service and a sense of business organization and profit and loss and the SERP, take the service model and apply it to the engineering business, both of those things, is, is, it's an opportunity that, that I've availed myself of and I think everybody here can too. So the last thing I would say is <clears throat> I think the vast majority of the audience here are students. This lecture will be a personal success for me if somebody will take away at least one small idea. Not about what you do, but that you can do it. And <clears throat> taking away that idea, and as we're teaching in 4803, 
you, you subject that to market analysis of business plans, need, idea generation, marketing, all the things that have to come into that, whether they are written on paper or whether they're intrinsic, <clears throat> it'll get you to where you can take the risk and start a business. So I hope somebody can take something away from that. <clears throat> it's terrible weather outside. Thank you for all coming out on this nasty day. This has been a great honor for me. Um, and I'm happy to open this up with questions if anybody's got any. Thank you for your very insightful lecture. I learned a lot from it. So I have my colleagues, many of my colleagues, right now they are taking data science related classes, for example, le machine learning data structure. So what's your vision about, uh, for example, and also some of them taking uh, computer science engineering as a minor. So how do you think this, uh, those data related technique will play a role in the engineering related business? Um, <clears throat> let me play back your question. How can taking classes in business and entrepreneurship fit into engineering? Was that your question? So my, well, many of my friends from Civil, they are right now taking like computer science class. So I was wondering how those uh, data science class will play a role in engineering, especially in Civil related and also business. Because I am the least techie guy you've ever met. So, <laughs> um, I damn near failed Fortran programming in 1973. So the compute, I would tell you the general answer is the world operates on tech these days. <clears throat> and understanding how that fits into the civil and environmental engineering business or in the construction business is hugely important. So I would consider that a very important well-rounding platform to look at what the, the technical aspects, tech being software, AI, all of those things, how that is changing the business. Because <clears throat> a lot of what I was trying to accomplish with the various business formations was to take the business laterally or vertically, do something around the core of engineering. And, from, and again, I'm not a, a software guy, but there's so much influence of software in terms of the way the profession is changing I would think that would be very valuable. Now, you mentioned you're a civil. Here's one of the things that we've learned, that I've learned from being involved with the external advisory board. There is a stellar statistic, and Don will correct me if I'm wrong, but it's somewhere on the order of 14% of civil engineering firms are from entrepreneurial activity guys who have graduated from Georgia Tech and started their own firm and they've become principals of those firms. So <clears throat> the, the fact that we have a higher percentage of principal ownership in the firms that we start compared to our engineering brethren in electrical and mechanical and industrial systems, I think that we are, <clears throat> I think we, we are the native proving ground to start businesses what I'm trying to accomplish and the reason that I'm teaching this class is to see what we can add to that entrepreneurial spirit and, and rounding. So I hope that covered some of your question. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. That was very, very insightful. Um, my question is more along the lines of uh, what influenced your decision to make a lot of break off companies instead of growing one single company? Low boredom threshold? Um, that's a true statement, but that's not what did it. Um, it was the desire to be successful, seeing an opportunity in the marketplace, and believing that I could fill that opportunity in the marketplace with a service or a good. Again, um, there are, this isn't true for everybody, but there are two paths through this business. The path that takes you to the chief technical officer of a big engineering practice. You know, there's only one of those in that firm. But the other path takes you through business management, leadership, marketing, executive ranks. There's a lot of paths there. 
So that's the path I sort of took. I, I, I never ascribed to be my own chief engineer. As soon as we got the firm up to where I could hire somebody smarter than me, that's the first thing I did. <clears throat> so each one of those opportunities was, again, me trying to see a need in the marketplace, a void in the marketplace, an opportunity to make money. Um, I don't know why capitalism's getting a bad name these days, but it, did, it didn't have a bad name when I was trying to do this. There was clearly a service and profit motive built into it. Bill, uh, most everybody, probably everyone in this room, particularly the students, have probably not become very uh, familiar with failure. Tell me, uh, can you share some insights in terms of resilience and what's, what, what you see uh, uh, the role of resilience playing over the arc of a 30, 40, 50 year career from, from the perspective of a student and what they should expect in the next uh, you know, a uh, period of years as they launch into their own careers. Okay, so putting on my engineering hat, I would tell you that engineering is not necessarily the easiest profession. First of all, you have to work with a lot of other engineers. <coughs> you got that joke too. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's highly technical. I believe the profession is changing rapidly. Um, and there are, a, there's a tremendous amount of challenges to stay on the technical side. You're not always going to get the promotion you want. You're not always going to be paid what you think you should be paid. When you change jobs, it might not be, the grass might not be greener than it is. So you will face disappointments in your career. I put on my business hat. It's the same thing. You're going to find disappointing opportunities. I closed down some companies. Didn't want to do it, but it was the practical thing to do. Fortunately, I never really lost any substantial amounts of money. You incorporate a business, again, Atlanta, Georgia is, the, the, the Atlanta I grew up in was a fast growing, entrepreneurial, um, hot place. It was easy to start a business. It cost $500. It's not, it's not a big capital investment. It still hurts when you close one down because it's an opportunity that you couldn't make happen. But the, the disappointments along your career they're on both sides. There are, you talk to enough people in mature guys in the civil engineering business, they've all had their ups and downs. <clears throat> civil is a unique profession compared to mechanical, electrical, some of the other disciplines because we are so influenced by the macro economy. You can be on top of the world one day and you can be without a client the next. So there are disappointments everywhere. But to be, first of all, I, I would use the word perseverant first. If you can't persevere, then you don't need to be in this business because you're gonna have to either on the business side or either on the technical side. And if, you're, if, you're, if you persevere, you will be resilient. You'll be able to, to, to take the blows and keep going. Uh, hi, first I'd like to say thank you for coming. Thank you for presenting. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your presentation and hearing all that you have done so far. Uh, throughout your career and you know good luck in the future as well but um in your presentation uh you mentioned that when you wanted to expand one of your businesses into california uh forgive me for forgetting the name of it because there, there are plenty plenty of companies you had to create an entire new organization called et california um, and in your lessons learned slide you mentioned that uh, the government is not your friend uh when it came to yeah i know i noticed uh, <laughs> but uh <laughs> the fact that uh, and, and this is, this is a tough thing to say. Um, I hate doing business in California, but it's our biggest revenue component. Um, the, the bureaucracy in California has become more onerous than the bureaucracy in Canada. <clears throat> so it, it's, they create laws to create more complexity, to create more fees. More fees, more government income. Here's a dirty little secret throughout the state of California because of their historic air quality issues. They have air quality management districts that are self-enforcing and self-funding. So to make the district work, they have to go out and issue fines and notices of violation and litigate in court to get funds to keep the bureaucracy going. That, that's just not right. But that's what California is like.
So it's, they're not your friend out there. It happens to be a very robust market for our services. Uh, thank you again. I have a quick question. What's your uh, number one criteria for deciding whether to whether or not to pursue a business idea? So say you have different ideas, why do you do you pick one over the other? Since I'm now teaching a class, I guess the political answer is, well, you should do a business plan, you should look at your market, you should do a market analysis, et cetera. Most of the opportunities you see here have been largely intuitive. They've been sort of tribal knowledge. Why did we go into the construction business when I was in the engineering business? Pretty simple. We couldn't find anybody who could execute the work that we were recommending to fix the problems that our clients had. So there was a need. I didn't have to overthink that. Um, some of these I didn't think out well enough. The issue with trying to do a Brownfields real estate company that would buy impacted properties, remediate it, and then resell that property, I missed the capital piece. So that was also a very intuitive decision, but it was a poor one. So <clears throat> today, um, I thought long and hard about the strategic investment and the VC piece. <clears throat> this is not like a VC out in Silicon Valley. This is VC written small. But I decided that it was worth the risk. And I've carefully picked the two companies that I invested in after looking at a lot of the different opportunities. So <clears throat> there's an, it, it, that one is a little bit more rational and rigorous because I've looked at what the risks of failure are. Um, but I, I so believe in their ideas and I so believe in the idea of entrepreneurial spirit, I'm willing to put money behind it. So is, is that kind of where you were going? Great. All right, we got another one back here. Hi, uh, thank you for that talk. It was really insightful. Um, I have a question more from the R&D perspective. So um, coming from an environmental engineering background, I see like a huge gap between the kind of technologies that we're working on in the labs versus what's actually making it out into the industry or you know being commercialized so in your experience based on your experience do you have any suggestions for people looking to commercialize um, cutting edge environmental technologies that on one hand have the scope to make a big difference and a change in uh, in the operating environment, but on the other hand also require large uh, capital investments before they're deployed and hence have uh, and are dealing with like risk averse entities like governments, municipalities. Back to my characterization slides with engineers versus entrepreneurs. <clears throat> engineers are risk averse. Entrepreneurs are risk managers. So <clears throat> I would tell you that at least in my career, um, I was willing to take risks on the engineering side. We, as CGC, we tried a lot of things that were outside the most conservative, rational solutions because we were trying to create value for our customers. So <clears throat> we were doing things in the early 80s that weren't that common. So, <clears throat> and that compares to the other businesses, product sales, other types of services, we weren't being all that innovative. We were just simply filling a need because we saw the need. So it, it, to take an R&D idea and to try to deploy it, somebody's got to be brave enough to take that risk and conversant enough with the client that he's serving to explain the fact that th this, is, this is new technology, it's got pros and cons, it's got benefits, it may be a tremendous value engineering idea, but that it, to deploy it is to not automatically blame us. We're trying on your behalf to try to solve a problem. So I think the, the, the first piece doesn't come from, you don't necessarily commercialize something first. You simply try to put it in practice first. And that you've got to be, you've, you've got to overcome some of your more conservative risk management decisions in order to do something different on the engineering side. We get one more round of applause for. Her. 
Thank you so much for taking the time to come and talk with us about your leadership journey and also how to grow a career as both an engineer and an entrepreneur. On behalf of the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, I'm honored to present you with this award as a token of our appreciation. Thank you, man. Thank you. So we want to thank um, Bill Higginbotham for his presentation and thank you all for coming. Um, we are going to have lunch served outside, so we encourage you to stay around and then interact with our uh, distinguished speaker and also be on the lookout for our next speaker um, in the, f we are in the spring? Yes, in the fall. <laughs> our next speaker in the fall, Stacy Sire, uh, the director of structures in Boeing and then in uh, the next uh, spring, Reggie DeRoche, uh, Provost of Rice University. Thank you all for coming.